man. Oh, Gary Tony coming out. Fights like Drip on that leg. Gary oh, 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 oh. Hi, this is Shadji. They say practice doesn't make perfect, it makes permanent. And recently with Gary Tonin's fight, we saw that this is absolutely true. Uh, this video is not a knock on the Danaher system or Gary Tonin. Gary Tonin is easily one of the greatest grapplers on the planet. But when you're so used to doing something, even though it goes against your intuition, like in a fight where striking is involved, you still go for it because you're confident with it and you can see what happened, the KO. And what I'm trying to say is if it can happen to Gary Tonin, then it can easily happen to you. So this video, we're going to see how the old masters approached leg locks and in what uh, logic they use them. So we will look at books and photos and see and try to rationalize their idea. So. First, let's take a look at Yukio Tani at the turn of the century. Straight ankle lock is your bread and butter when it comes to leg locks, in my opinion. So here you can see him. First of all, this is an inside leg lock. If he turns back and look at his uke, you would see that this is not an outside, but an inside um, straight ankle lock. You see how he is stepping over to cover the waist which prevents Uke from having a lot of uh, mobility. And also, uh, you can see the, quote, Kimura grip on the ankle. It looks rather deep, so I would say this is attacking the Achilles and not so much the calf. So if he would to um, retract his shoulders and flex his lower back, I would say he can easily pop the ankle. Um, another thing is... Notice that he is standing up while Uke is down, and we're gonna see this quite a lot in this video. So, this can either come from uh, a takedown after a takedown where you need to pass guard, but instead you grab the leg and you attack, uh, or um, through an entanglement on the ground and then you catch the leg and you stand up. So, uh, but I would say the first uh, scenario is the more applicable because this generation was very much invested into self-defense. Com competing, yes, was a thing, but not so much like today. The idea of self-defense was very big. And so doing it from standing, in my opinion, it is the best to prevent any type of repercussions or consequences uh, when it comes to striking. Notice he's locking the hips. He cannot move. And also uh, the grip, he can easily just... Because the lever is so short on inside uh, ankle locks, if he just retracts his shoulders and flexes his back, he can just pop uh, the ankle. There's a reason why IBJJF for white belts, they say it should be an outside. So the lever is longer and thus, you know, to keep it more safe. The next one is none other than Mitsuyo Maeda. He's basically doing the same thing. But if you notice the, uh, the grip is much different. I would say he's grabbing his wrist. You cannot see, but I would say he's grabbing his wrist while making a fist with the other hand. Um, it's not it's not uh, as deep on the ankle as the first one. It is down more towards the calf. So this one is more of a calf crank than uh, a straight foot lock or targeting the ankle. Uh, don't get me wrong. It will hurt a lot. We practice this in the self-defense class that we do on Wednesday. And you can still feel it the next day. You're going to be walking funny the next day. So this one, again, is very much effective if you apply the right pressure and you turn your wrist outwards on the bone um, for self-defense. I would say if you take them down and apply it, the the chance of them getting back up and chasing you is very slim. Now here, this one is from the 1912 book, uh, Jujutsu book of uh, Yoshinori Iguchi. Um, it is not as sophisticated as the first two that we've seen, but it follows the same logic. The UK is down while Tori is up. Um, the only thing that's missing is having the leg across the waist and turning them to their side. So they have very little mobility or very chance for defense or retaliation. But if you see the grip, the Kimura grip, um, how it's wrapped around the Achilles, uh, it's very easy to pop the ankle from this point. The lever is short. He is standing up. He can easily just finish the lock from there. But he can get kicked in the ribs. He can get kicked in the face. Uh, again, it's not as sophisticated as the first two that we've seen. But it follows the same logic. So 
I would imagine these locks are being done uh, in the following uh, way. So here you have someone being attacked. This is a self-defense video. He gets it uh, outside, inside ankle lock and then yanks it and gets it immediately. So I would imagine the logic behind leg locks at the time was the following. So you got attacked. This generation was very much invested in self-defense. You get attacked. Um, you have the legs in front of you. You grab the leg, you pop it, and then you get away. So there is very little chance that they would get up and retaliate. Or if you want to flee the scene, it's going to be very hard for them to run fast, whether it's a calf crunch or, you know, just pop the leg completely. Here, after a serenage, let's say they turn towards you, you grab it, and then you can do whatever. Here, it looks very much like a calf crunch or a calf crank rather than uh, an Achilles lock or a foot lock. So you can see it's on the calf. It's clearly on the calf. You can also get a little bit sophisticated and turn them around and do a little bit more damage. Uh, so it's not like the competitive scene that we see today. The next one is, of course, Ashi Garami Judo's greatest leg lock. It can be done from standing. Notice how he's stepping on the arm. He's grabbing the other leg with his hand behind his back. And he's pulling the upper body. He has complete control of the entire body, even though it's just a leg lock. And this is what I really like about the, this uh, leg lock. So... Not only it is very devastating on the MCL, it can either sprain it or completely rip it. Uh, but also, look at the complete control that Akitaro Ono has on, I believe this is Koizumi as his uke. Uh, this is from the early 1910s of the, ex uh, the Japanese English Expo. And, um, excuse me, here you can see how effective and devastating this can be. And uh, if you read the old... Uh, Maruyama Sanzo records or writings. Um, Tanabe did this after performing a Morote Gari. So the very famous story of the third dan Yuji Hiruka against Mataimon Tanabe. Um, Tanabe performs a Morote Gari. This is Morote Gari and then immediately follows it through with Ashi Garami. So I would imagine he did it standing up because as you reap both legs, you can easily reap the knee afterwards and then proceed to do Ashigarami by pulling on the upper body and uh, straightening your leg. Let's see a demonstration of this. So here, uh, the legs are in front of you. You reap the knee and then pull on the sleeve and get the lock. I suggest you get an uke and try this, but very slowly. It does hurt like hell. I have tried it and it works. Um, ripping the knee in IBJJF is obviously illegal, so you don't see many Ashigarami being done. Um, the next one is the one uh, being done from the ground. There is uh, still safety, in my opinion, being done uh, or protecting yourself from Uke. Here, after a failed Tomoenage, you rip the knee, you go to their side or their blind side, I would say, and extend your leg and pull on the upper body. Since you have the pull on the upper body, um, getting a strike in the face is, I would say, very unlikely because you are controlling the arm. And also, what's very important is that um, you are turning away to their blind side. So they're not, like here, for example, the Tomoenage, you're controlling the arm. So getting hit in the face is very unlikely unless they get you with the other arm, but uh, you, you turn away immediately from the other arm, the one that's far away, so getting hit becomes very difficult, or if they choose to do so, or if they can do so, it's going to be uh, little little to no effectiveness uh, behind it. And also, you know, clothing and gi, etc., in self-defense is can be to your advantage. Uh, the clothing is a very essential part of self-defense for control, for gripping, even if it's just a t-shirt. Um, here you can see he is clearly far away from the other hand while also controlling the other arm. So uh, this is after a failed Tomoenage. There is still some safety in it, but uh, when it comes to multiple opponents, you don't even go for Tomoenage in the first place. So... Uh, if you are sure of your environment and you know there's someone, there's no one else and you can go for Tomoenage, it's your specialty, you get it every time, you're very confident with it, 
Ashigarami, you can still get it and finish it and run away from the scene. Um, here you can see it on the right side. Um, this is the same book, the Yoshinori Iguchi book from 1912, uh, being done also turning away to their blind side and performing it. Um, it is less safe than the straight foot locks that we've seen or the standing Ashigarami that we've seen, but here we are more in the competitive territory where striking is not allowed and you can obviously get away with something like this. And finally is the stuff that we see today. It is the where both have their buttocks on the ground, um, where someone controls the hips and the legs with their own legs and performs a heel hook, like in this photo, or a straight ankle lock or a knee bar. So you see the knee bar was completely invented in a competitive sporting uh, context. Um, Yaichibe invented it in the 1920s. Here it is documented in 1926 in the book, uh, New Style of Judo. Um, hips on the ground, both on the ground, because it was the Kosen Judo rivalry between him and Oda. And so there was a lot of ground grappling, not so much with strikes or realistic, you know, context like self defense. And then, of course, you have this uh, being performed by Ienishi Sadakazu. Um, I would say this, you know, the stuff that we see today with the Dan and her desk squad, etc., are being performed. Uh, strictly in the competitive context and thus there's very there's little to no um consideration to striking i'm not saying they don't work in mma of course they do there's tons of knee bars and heel hooks being done in mma but what you've seen gary tonen do is pull guard and try to get it and he paid the price dearly and like i said in the beginning of the video if it can happen to tonen it can happen to anyone so uh, recently i put up a poll and i asked do you train gi no gi or both a big chunk actually voted strictly nogi. So I imagine a lot of you are doing heel hooks and straight ankle locks. So uh, I'm going to ask you, can you actually do a heel hook standing up or have you actually attempted it? I would be very uh, curious to know. Please let me know down below. So this video is to see the approach of leg locks that the old masters were doing. Those that were very much invested in self-defense. And what I see is after a takedown, you do a foot lock so you prevent them from getting back up and chasing after you. So you'd get uh, time and the capability to flee the scene. If you have anything else to add, let me know down below. This was Shadi and thank you for listening.